Well, good morning. Dennis, I, I, I do want to tell you, I, I know as a church we appreciate the work that you put in there, and I know it's hard to get up <laughs> and, and uh, make these announcements. That, oh, crap. No, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Glad you're all happy. <laughs> anyway, I know some of those things that you have to share are difficult, and I, I appreciate the, and I know as a church we appreciate uh, your, your stewardship of that. It, it is, uh, they are difficult things to share. Um, and, and to your point, uh, I know sharing those things in service, I know we're talking about Christ and talking about Christmas, and it feels like a downer, but at the same time, the reality is, uh, every time that there has been a need, and we have brought it before the congregation, the congregation has honestly gone over and above to take care of those problems. Um, we bring it to you, um, much like we bring it to the Lord, because we trust that the Lord can do something about it. And when you guys know of needs, whether it's the needs of people in our community, the needs of people in our church, or even just financial needs, you guys have responded in, in uh, truly, uh, ways that are, are, are truly a blessing to see. Uh, so uh, I understand talking about finances in the middle of a service it can feel difficult. Um, but we also realize you can't fix problems you don't know about. Uh, and I know many of you, once you know that these problems exist, um, go out of your way uh, to help them be taken care of. And we, we thank you for that. And Dennis, I, I thank you uh, for your stewardship of of the finances. It's not an easy job. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Acts chapter 15. Uh, today, we're going to look at the Jerusalem Council. Um, and, and the reality is that throughout New Testament and church history, there have been times when the followers of Christ have needed to assemble together to deal with wrongful theology that may, has made its way into the church. Uh, and these councils throughout church history and New Testament history have marked important times of growth for the church. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, the Nicene Council uh, was the very first ecumenical council of the church, and it took place in the city of Nicaea, which is in uh, present-day Turkey. It was called by the Roman Emperor Constantine in A.D. 325. Uh, the main accomplishments of this huge group of followers of Christ uh, was working on settling a Christological issue about the divine nature of Jesus Christ and his relationship with God the Father. In other words, after this, uh, after this group of people, this council met, we have what we now understand as the theology of the Trinity. And that was what they brought uh, to, uh, to the Christian world of that time. Uh, it also res resulted in the first uniform Christen Christian doctrine called the Nicene Creed. Some of you may be familiar with the Nicene Creed. That came uh, from this. It was an explanation of what followers of Jesus Christ genuinely believe. Another important council was the council at uh, Chalcedon, uh, which was held uh, also in the city of Chalcedon, which is also in present-day Turkey, and this happened in 1451. This was, uh, this was called by the Emperor Marcion. It was attended by over 500 bishops of the church and was the largest and best documented of the early church councils. Its primary accomplishment was rejecting the doctrine that Christ had only one nature and insisted in the unity of the divine and human persons of Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ is fully human He's also fully God. It was at this council that the Church of Jesus Christ recognized that as the teaching of the Bible. While these councils were necessary and at, for the continued spread of the gospel, uh, their impact was not as critical as what we're going to see today in Acts chapter 15. Today we're going to explore the issues and decisions 
that were made at the first Jerusalem council. And while this meeting of early Christian leaders is, it still has a tremendous impact on how we worship Jesus Christ today. Well, as you guys know, in, in our study of the book of Acts, we just followed, uh, we just finished up studying uh, the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. They went to Cyprus and Asia Minor, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to both Jews and Gentiles throughout that area. And they had, while they had some trials and tribulations along the way, they also saw many, many people come to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 28, which we looked at last week, tells us that after coming home to their church in Antioch, they, they, had, uh, they gathered together with all the believers. I imagine they had like a potluck dinner or something like that. And, and they shared all, their, uh, all the events that happened from their missionary journey, all the stops along the way that we took some time to study. Uh, they shared with them. But it also tells us that after this really intense mission strip that they were on, that Paul and Barnabas uh, had an extended break from traveling. And it says that they enjoyed fellowship in their own church. In other words, Paul and Barnabas got a much needed rest. They got, to, they got to sit in the pew and relax and be fed instead of feeding other people. But as we're going to see here today in Acts chapter 15, their work for the kingdom of God uh, was far from over. So like I said, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts chapter 15, we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 21 this morning. Here's what God's Word has to say. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed with some of the other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how Gentiles had been converted. This news made all believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything that God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe that it is through grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they, had, when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people from his name from the Gentiles. The word of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, after this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. The rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, things known from long ago. This is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from meats of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Let's pray and we'll explore uh, this first council together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to look at your word, to read your word, to understand and interpret your word and to apply it to our lives today. The same truths that the church is dealing with here in Acts 15 are, are the same things we deal with today, Father. So Lord, guide us and direct us through your Holy Spirit 
as we consider what, these, what this passage says for us. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we saw, most of uh, Acts chapter 15 covers the events of the first Jerusalem council. And uh, while reading this chapter of the Bible is equivalent to reading uh, meeting minutes, in fact, if you're interested, we have meetings here at the church. We keep all the minutes back there. If you really liked that passage and you're like, man, that was compelling stuff, you can grab, the, you can grab deacon's minutes, uh, trustee's minutes, they're all up, up there, and you can read through our meetings, our, our minutes from our meetings. This may seem like a kind of an inconsequential passage, and it may seem a little daunting if you're, if you're not uh, interested in the details of, of these meetings. But frankly, what we see here, the decisions and the discussions that they have here in Acts chapter 15 are essential for the growth of the church going forward. And the decisions they make at the end of this chapter are going to have a lasting impact on what happens as the gospel goes to the ends of the earth. So let's take a look at this for a minute. Let's start by looking at the event. What is it that brought about this first council? Well, if you look in verses 1 and 2, we see that teachers come to the church in Antioch teaching salvation that included circumcision and adherence to the Mosaic law. So we have these teachers that come from Judea. We find out in verse 24, if you go a little bit beyond this passage, that the Jerusalem church says, hey, we didn't send these guys. They came on their own accord. Like th this, this wasn't teachers that the Jerusalem church sent. They were on their own. So they come into this Antioch church. Now remember the church in Antioch, and we looked at the foundation of the church a few weeks ago, is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. They're worshiping together in this church. So these teachers come in and they say to the Gentiles that are in the congregation, unless you are circumcised and you start following the Mosaic law, you're not actually saved. Well, not surprisingly, what was Paul and Barnabas' response to this? They just spent a whole mission trip preaching the same gospel to both Jews and Gentiles, right? They didn't differentiate between the two. They preached Jesus Christ crucified to both of them. So when this guy gets up in their home church, or these, these teachers get up in their home church and say, hey, you got to get circumcised, you got to start following the Mosaic law, or you ain't going to heaven. What's Paul and Barnabas' response? It says they immediately start, uh, start disputing them in church, and they're so riled up about this that they decide, hey, we're going to Jerusalem and we're going to find out, is this what they're teaching in Jerusalem too? So th they get in contact with the apostles, Peter, James, John, all these guys, and the elders of the Jerusalem church and say, hey, we'd like to have a meeting. And we want to make sure that we're all preaching the same gospel here. So they get to Jerusalem and we have this big assembly, the elders of the church in Antioch, the church in Jerusalem, the apostles are all there, and everybody is talking. We got Paul and Barnabas that are sharing the events of, of their first missionary journey. We have people, we have Pharisees who are now believers in Jesus Christ who are saying, hey, we, we think after they're saved, they should start following the Mosaic Covenant. But they can get saved through Jesus Christ, but after that, they should, they should start following the Mosaic Law. And ultimately, what we see is the council meets together, they make a decision, and a letter is drafted and taken to the church in Antioch. We didn't read the letter. You guys can read that. It's the next couple of verses. Uh, but it basically summarizes what James said at the end of uh, the passage that we read. So that's really what's happening. There, there was some, what Paul and Barnabas believed to be some false teaching in their church. They decide to gather all the followers of Jesus together and get to the bottom of what should be taught in church. Well, that's the event that led to this. But let's talk for a second. What is the major issue that they're dealing with? Well, if you have your Bibles open, let's look at verses 1 and 2 again. Let's read this because this is the event that kind of sparks uh, this, this big meeting of the church. And listen to what it says in verses 1 and 2. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. 
This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some others, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So let me ask you, what is the issue that, it, that leads to this meeting of these followers of Jesus Christ? What is the primary issue here? <laughs> we're we're going to bust out in the song here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, I, I, and I heard a couple different people say, the primary issue here is that these teachers from, that came from Judea are preaching that salvation comes from works. Yeah, they said, unless you are circumcised, unless you do this human action, unless you adhere to the Mosaic law, unless you do the works of the law, it says, they could not get saved. Not they got saved and then decided to do that stuff. They said, no, you're not eligible for salvation unless you are circumcised and you begin to follow the Mosaic law. In other words, all those people that Paul and Barnabas led to the Lord, and they didn't, they didn't circum, we don't read that they circumcised anyone. We don't read that they made them be, uh, become proselytes to Judaism. They would say, none of those people actually had a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. They are all still lost in their sin. See, in verse 1, we see that these teachers from Judea were saying that unless they were circumcised, it couldn't be saved. In other words, they had turned salvation into an act, from an act of God's grace into a work of man. Needless to say, this didn't sit well with the church in Antioch, and frankly, it shouldn't sit well with us either. Why? Well, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us. It says this, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I'm not sure the Bible can put it much clearer than that. Salvation is not a work of our hands. It is a gift of God. Listen, if we can earn heaven, guess what? We should be celebrated as people. Man, if I could do enough good that I could get myself to heaven, I'm pretty awesome. But the Bible says that's not the case at all. It is a gift given to me by God. I have no reason to boast in anything I do because nothing I do gets me to heaven. It is not good works that make us right in the eyes of God. It is God's grace that any of us are saved. Paul goes on and explains this even more in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, when he says this, For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That idea of being justified is being found not guilty in the eyes of God. When, when, when someone is justified, it's as God seeing them as without sin. God doesn't see us without sin because we've done a couple good things in our lives. He sees us without sin because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. The Judaizers that spoke in Antioch were teaching that followers of Christ had to adhere to the Mosaic law in order to obtain salvation. And the Bible is abundantly clear that that is not the case. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, we read this. Now that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one, is justified. Now listen, there are a lot of deep theological terms that are found in those passages, but simply put, if it were up to us, if somehow we could be justified by the works we do, it still wouldn't be enough. The reality is we can't do enough good to undo the sin in our lives. I found a video that, that simplifies what what. Galatians 2 is talking about. Let me show this to you right now. See, the problem, the problem that we face as people, and, and the reason that we don't want this to be works-based is simple. The Bible tells us very clearly we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
if we're honest with ourselves, some of us, for some of us, it's pretty easy to see our sin. For some of us, we lie to ourselves. We try to balance the scale. We try and think, well, I've done so much more good than bad. But the reality is the Bible tells us that a single sin separates us from God. How many things do I need to steal to be a thief? How many people do I need to kill to be a murderer? How many sins make me a sinner? One. And the reality is, the truth is, no matter how much we endeavor to do good in our lives, and listen, we are, we are fully capable of doing things that please God. The reality is that a single sin separates us from God. That why, that's why it can't be a work. It can't be the things that we do because we can't get there. Theologian R.C. Lenski writes this, To add anything to Christ as being necessary to salvation, say circumcision or any other kind of human work, is to deny that Christ is the complete Savior. It's to put something human on par with Him, to make it the crowning point. And this is fatal for us. A bridge to heaven that is built 99% of Christ but on, and 1% of us breaks down at the joint and ceases to be a bridge. Even if Christ is to be thought as carrying us 999 miles of the way and some, something merely human be required for that last mile, this would leave us hanging in the air of heaven and still being so far away. See, what makes the gospel truly amazing, hear me this when I say this, is that it is available to any person at any moment. Now, if there's human works involved, that's not the truth. But the reality is, if you're sitting here right now and you say, I want to believe in Jesus, I want to know this very moment, if I could have everlasting life, it is available to you. Why? Because it's not about you or about us. It's about God's grace. Since there's no human effort and no human work involved, a person only needs to believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and call upon him to be the Lord of their lives. If you want to get saved, there's no need for a church meeting. There's no need for a membership class, for baptism, for circumcision, for the right hand of fellowship. It is just you and Jesus Christ. That's why Paul can write this in 2 Corinthians 6 2. He says this, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Why? Because it's not dependent on us. It's not dependent on this church. It's not dependent on what you've done or what you're going to do. You don't have to go through some, some ceremony or anything like that. Today, this moment can be the moment of salvation. Why? Because it's only through the grace of God. I can go into Wawa and I can share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. And if they want to believe they can believe. And that is what makes salvation so amazing. That's why it's amazing grace. That's why we sing the song. Because any moment God can change someone's eternity with no strings attached, with no burden added on. This is what Paul and Barnabas were fighting about. He said, no, stop adding things to salvation. God has done the work. He's the one who went to the cross. He's the one who paid the price. He's the one that did the heavy lifting so we can believe and be saved. Think about how freeing that is. Your salvation is not based on where you're sitting right now or how many straight Sundays you've sat there. Your attendance in church and, and Sunday school and things like that really doesn't matter when it comes to salvation. What matters? That you know and put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's what the Bible teaches about salvation. That's why Paul and Barnabas said, let's get everybody together and let's talk this out because we can't afford to get this wrong. 
And that's what they did. So let's look at the result uh, of all this. Uh, after much discussion, uh, Paul and Barnabas and, and many others from the church in Antioch come together with the church in Jerusalem, the, uh, the elders and the apostles. And after much discussion, the apostles and elders explain that not only did Gentile believers not need to be circumcised, but they did not need to be beholden to the Mosaic law even after they were saved. In other words, they said, listen, you don't have to believe in the Mosaic law to get saved, and you don't have to conform to the Mosaic law after you get saved. Why? Well, the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we read this. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. They are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The Bible says, listen, the Mosaic law was a shadow of what God wanted. The real thing, Jesus Christ, is here. So believe in him. Hebrews 8.13 says it this way. By calling this covenant the new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. See, these believers had the real thing. They had the genuine article. Salvation has been provided through Jesus Christ. There was no need to go back to sacrificing animals, to following the 300 plus commands of the Mosaic Covenant, because the one true sacrifice that paid for sin before, during, and forever has come. The old Mosaic Covenant was obsolete. Why would you go back? How many of you all owned a black and white TV at some point? How many of you still own a black and white TV? Why not? <laughs> Walt still got one. <laughs> Why don't you own a black and white TV anymore? Because <laughs> who wants to watch things in black and white? <laughs> we got color. We got life. Why in the world would we make these people go back to an old and obsolete covenant when we have the author of truth who has died for us? See, now that these believers had found Jesus Christ, there was no reason for them to go back to an old and obsolete set of laws and regulations. So the question that comes up, you say, well, pastor, this is great news because I'm not beholden to the Mosaic law. So does that mean I have no rules to obey? <laughs> well, the Bible tells us that we are called to be obedient to the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21 says this, To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law so as to win those not having the law. Does that mean that we are free from all rules and regulations? We're free to do whatever we want, whenever we want? No. There is still a standard for us to hold to. Jesus Christ gives us that standard. As followers of Jesus, we are free from the statutes and commands of the Mosaic law, but we are still called to follow the law of God that is given to us in the New Testament. What does that look like? Well, Paul gives us an overview of this in Galatians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, do me a favor, flip to, flip to Galatians chapter 5. We're gonna, this is a kind of a long section, but, but Paul doesn't explain everything. But what he does is he gives us a picture of what the law of Christ looks like in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. This is Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25. Paul writes this, So I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, 
drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's the law of Christ. In the law of Christ, it tells us to abstain from certain things, and it also says to do other things. It gives us a list, not not an exhaustive list. There are other things in the New Testament that we're told to abstain from, but it also tells us what our lives should look like as well, filled with love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is what our lives should look like. This is what it means to live the law of Christ. See, we've been unshackled from the old covenant. And we've been given a new covenant, not that's written down on paper, but is, the Bible says is written on our hearts. Oh, and by the way, it is in the Bible as well. In light of these truths, the apostles and elders wrote a letter to the Gentiles in the church of Antioch. And you can read this letter in verses 24 to 29. It affirmed that salvation is found in Christ alone. They also asked them, uh, also asked the Gentiles of the church in Antioch to abstain from common Gentile practices, which would cause Jewish believers Uh, who still followed the Mosaic law to stumble. If you're wondering why James asked them not to eat food that's sacrificed to idols, you say, well, aren't they free from all those things? Yes. What James is asking them to do is, listen, if you eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols, it's not going to cause you to stumble. You know who it's going to cause to stumble? Those Jews who are still stuck in the Mosaic law. He says, listen, it's going to be hard for them to deal with. So if you can, abstain from those things. You're free but they are still working through un- unyoking themselves from the Mosaic law, so do it for their sake. In other words, the letter they send to the Gentiles in Antioch treated them as the more mature believers in Jesus Christ. Why? Because they understood that they weren't under the law. But they said, be careful, be thoughtful to people that still believe in that. So what does this mean for us? Well, honestly, the exact same thing that it meant for them. The same truth that they are dealing with here in Acts 15 is the same truth that we deal with today. Do we live in a world that people are still trying to earn their way to heaven? Absolutely. Listen, that video we watch, in my time as a pastor, I've had people come to me with every one of those excuses and many more. Hey, I'm just trying to balance the scales. I've done a whole bunch of good and only a little bit of bad. People who don't even understand what sin is. The reality is we still live in a world and we still even have people in church who think that I'm going to earn my way to heaven. I'm going to heaven because my family has gone to this church for generations. I've sat in that particular pew for year after year. And listen, that's great. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad your family's been here. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But it's not what gets you to heaven. Jesus, his grace, his forgiveness is what gets you to heaven. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. Anything other than that, if you hear any message preached from this pulpit, Other than that, guess what? We need to have our own counsel. (laughs) We need to get together and start proclaiming the truth because this is the way that people get to heaven. Not through works of humanity, but through the work of Jesus Christ. See, you don't need this church to get to heaven. Now, that may sound blasphemous coming from its pastor. But you don't need my sermons. You don't need this church to get to heaven. You don't need works to get to heaven. You don't need to put money in the offering plate 
You don't need to show up every Sunday. You don't need pristine references from godly people to get to heaven. You know what you need to get to heaven? Jesus Christ. That's it. Everything else we do is a result of the joy that we have from knowing Jesus Christ. We come and we worship. Why? Because we know Christ and we know how much he's done for us. We give because Christ first gave to us. We love one another because Christ first loved us. Everything we do is not what gets us to heaven because nothing we can do gets us to heaven. What we do is a result of what Christ has done for us. So how do you receive Jesus Christ? You say, well, Pastor George, that sounds awesome. I would love to get to heaven, and I've already messed some things up in my life, so I'm really glad to hear that it's not based on the works I do. So how do I get to heaven? How can I know I have a right relationship with Christ? How can this moment be my moment of salvation? It's very simple and incredibly profound at the same time. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. A sin is anything we think, anything we say, anything that we do that is contrary to the will of God. The Bible tells us we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, the Bible tells us, not even one. In other words, none of us deserve heaven. And because of our sin, there is a penalty. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin, the payment of sin, is death. In other words, all of us, because we've all sinned, all deserve the same thing. We deserve not just physical death, but eternal separation from God. But while the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23 goes on to tell us that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his Son. In other words, God chose not to give us what we deserved, but to offer us everlasting life through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Well, how do we receive that gift? We're just a few weeks away for Christmas. Some of you, maybe most of you, are going to receive some kind of gift. But those gifts kind of sit under the tree. They don't become yours until you do what? Until you open them. The same is true with salvation. That gift is available to all people, but we have to receive it for ourselves. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we would be saved. Not we might be saved, not we could be saved, not that we'll be entered into a raffle to be saved. We can be certain that we are saved. We can know that today is the day of salvation. That's amazing, isn't it? No wonder we sing about this stuff. God loved us so much that he sent his son to pay the price that we can't dream of paying and to offer us admission, adoption into his family. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, again, you don't need me. You don't need the church. You don't need some special meeting after extra mile today, right here where you're sitting, at this moment, you can ask Jesus Christ to forgive your sins. You can confess that he is the Lord of your life and that you believe in him. And you know what? The Bible says you will be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to look at your word and uh, while reading about a business meeting may not sound like compelling, a compelling passage of the Bible, the reality is the things that they deal with at this meeting are incredibly important. They spell out the way that we come to know you as our Lord and Savior. And Lord, we are so thankful for the decision that they made. And even if they had gotten it wrong, you would have found a way. But Lord, we are thankful that your gift of salvation is not bought or earned. Because to be honest with you, there probably wouldn't be enough money for us to buy it. And we can't be good enough to earn it. And we'd all just sit there missing out 
on the greatest gift that has ever been offered. But Lord, none of us have to miss out. That gift is available to anybody and everybody. To all who would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ can be saved. So if there's anyone here today who's never called on you as the Lord and Savior, or maybe there are some here who thought they know you, but they've been trying to earn your love instead of just receiving your love. I pray that you would be with them today. Because today can be the day of their salvation. This moment could be the moment that they go from being citizens of earth to being citizens of heaven. Lord, I ask for your blessing. I ask for your guidance. And I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.